Welcome, welcome. Um, I am thrilled that you are joining us this evening for Stick It, Five Inspired Adhesives. Um, I've been very excited about a lot of our Spirit of STEM webinars, but I'm actually super excited about this one. So we can get going much sooner and faster. I am with the Center for Excellence in Education, which was founded in 1983 by Joanne Gennaro and Admiral Rickover, father of the nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power. And our goal here is to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. And we offer three, uh, three programs for teachers and students in the, in the United States. Uh, we offer the Research Science Institute, um, which actually is going through their selection process right now, and that's a six-week summer program. So if anyone out there is a sophomore or freshman this year, uh, you actually apply this um, during your junior year um, to attend right before your senior year. We have the USABO, which is the uh, nation's largest uh, biology education and testing program, and they are about to go into their semifinals. And I run the teacher enrichment program, which is we're trying to connect uh, STEM teachers, so science, math, and PTE teachers with STEM professionals to share a little bit about what STEM, how STEM professionals use classroom content uh, in, their, in their work. And today I am very, very thrilled to have uh, Philip Messersmith, uh, PhD, who's the class of 1941 professor at the Department of Bioengineering and Material Science and Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley and uh, Dr. Al Frosty, Professor of Polymer Science and Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Russell Smith, you can take it away. It's a pleasure to be here. So I would like to uh, spend a few minutes talking about my work on muscle-inspired adhesives. This is actually something I've been working on for uh, over 20 years now, um, which dates me uh, in my age. Uh, so it, I thought it'd be a good idea to start with a few simple def definitions. And these, I will admit, are directly from Wikipedia. Okay, um, so biomimetic and bio-inspired, what do they mean? Um, so, so biomimetic means uh, the, the concept is to emulate um, uh, models or systems or elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems. Whereas bioinspired is a subtle, subtly different, but um, it, my, my interests are more aligned with bioinspired. And the, the idea here is that um, you're inspired by nature, but not necessarily limited by what you observe or see or understand from, from nature. Um, and a, a good way of explaining that uh, would be, you know, it, it's, uh, in nature, organisms solve problems in very restricted and confined and, and prescribed environments. Whereas what we can learn about how they go about that could be applied to many other situations, okay? And that's more in, in terms of inspiration, that's more what we do in, in my group. So we're, we have in mind to learn from biology, apply it uh, in, in a, a variety of different ways, which you know, in nature, never intended or thought about. My own uh, particular interest uh, has been in uh, muscle-inspired materials. And, and so these are uh, specifically marine muscles, uh, those that you find in the sea. There are, of course, freshwater versions of these, but um, many people know muscles as being uh, basically, you know, something you might get in a restaurant. Um, but if you've ever been to the seashore, you may have seen, um, particularly in, in uh, North America uh, and other places in the world, you may have seen mussels attached to rocks. And, and this is the part um, that has fascinated me for, um, as I said, over 20 years. They actually uh, attach to each other. So the first layer of mussels attaches to something like a rock or it could be a pier or ship pole or any, any structure in the marine environment. Um, and then, other layers attached to the muscles. So you have these clusters and it's kind of hard to see how they do this, but uh, the picture on the upper right of the slide uh, shows this a little bit better, which is a, a muscle attached to a uh, shiny surface here. And uh, the interest uh, of, of my um, uh, uh, bio-inspired work is, is this structure, which is called the muscle byssus. Uh, it's just basically a, a collection of fibers, each of which is terminated by a pad of glue, if you will, uh, where the glue uh, attaches to whatever that, that surface is. And the fibers all 
come in and converge just inside the shell uh, to the soft tissue of the of the muscle, and it keeps it. There's a there's a muscle muscle uh, that keeps all of these fibers here uh, in in tension, and and so this is this is the entire um, attachment structure of the muscle. This is how it survives in a turbulent environment. And uh, back to the idea of inspiration, which is that you know we we feel like there's a lot to learn about how to um, accomplish adhesion to wet surfaces for a variety of of uh, potential applications uh, from learning about the the muscles. And so we have been studying this for quite some time. This is an electron micrograph. Lower right is an electron micrograph picture of one of these uh, glue pads, and you can see the fiber that comes off of the, the the glue pad, and then eventually ends up going into the inside of the muscle shell. Uh, this is where the action is at, as it relates to adhesion. So these are I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute, but these are very specialized glue proteins that the muscles secrete. But first, when I, I want to show you a video or two, actually two videos uh, of this process. So what, what I would like to show you is a video of, of one of these being formed in real time. It takes about uh, two, two to four minutes total to make one of these um, uh, attachments. And so this video that I'll show you here is basically uh, going to show one of those. The video is going to show secretion of one of these fibers and the glue pad. Uh, from start to finish. So we have a, an aquarium in the, in the lab and uh, put, put muscles in there and we can take a video through a piece of glass. So the muscle here is sitting inside and in, immersed in water and it's going to attach to a plate of glass that you see. Uh, so we're taking the picture through a plate of glass. Um, this is what is called the muscle foot. This part of the organism that uh, is responsible for secreting these uh, fibers. So the first thing it does is actually comes out of the muscle shell and um, basically probes around on the surface. When it finds a place it wants to secrete an attachment, um, it will press hard on the surface. And that's what you're, you're seeing right here. Um, and, and so the muscle foot has glands that store the protein and then in liquid form, and then it injects the protein into a little cavity directly on the surface, which makes this uh, glue pad. And then it also injects protein to make the fiber. It's a, a little, there's a little groove that runs along the length of the foot pad. And then those liquid proteins actually react and solidify into solids in about one or two minutes. And then at the end of that process, after it's solidified, the muscle foot will pull away and you'll be able to see this newly formed adhesive pad you see, this is the glue pad on the surface, and then the fiber that goes back into the um, uh, the, the muscle shell. That for me is is super fascinating as a material scientist uh, and one somebody who loves nature. Uh, this is very elegant processing of a material. There's no other purpose for this tissue in the organism except to anchor it. Uh, on, onto the underlying uh, surface. Uh, now the muscle, as you can uh, guess from some of these pictures I've already shown you, uh, does this many times. And the, the second video, this is much shorter. Um, I, I wanna show you the video of, of, of uh, a um, capture of, of a muscle secreting four or five of these threads over a four or five hour period. Uh, so one thing I wanna point out before um, I show you that is there's a very clear rubbery material. It's a silicone uh, material that is on the on the surface and between the surface and the muscle. The rubber bands that you see here going back and forth, these are actually just to help attach the muscle onto or put the muscle onto the surface. And and actually this experiment we was we were trying to understand if the muscle would prefer the the glass surface, which is out here or would prefer to attach to this soft rubbery material. So let me start the video now. And uh, so this is a, a frame grabs every 30 seconds over many hour period. So you see the muscle foot come out. And, and one curious thing is that it, it, it pokes around over here and then finds that it doesn't like that surface. And then it ends up secreting these attachments over here. You see a couple of these threads that have been, been secreted and eventually it falls off of the rubber band here. So it, it made in, in about four hours, it made 
um, four or five of these uh, threads. And then the mussel does that many times, and it depends on the season, the weather conditions, et cetera, how, mu how many of those threads it makes. So it's really fascinating materials processing uh, of a, a glue that works well underwater. Uh, and to preface the rest of my talk, it, which is that that's no small accomplishment. We, many, many man-made adhesives don't perform well underwater, okay? And so this, this is something that we believe that we can learn from. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about the biochemistry here. It's very, very complicated, but I'll try to make it very simple, which is the, these proteins, particularly the glue proteins, and this is a cartoon, if you will, of the one of these glue pads, uh, has about six or seven proteins that are known in the structure. And they are distinctive for having an unusual amino acid. So that amino acid is called DOPA. It's derived from a, 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 another amino acid in the proteins. Some of these proteins have very high concentrations of, of DOPA. So the red Ys here that are underlined are all DOPA amino acids. And it's a remarkable um, feature of these proteins that they have so much DOPA. In elsewhere in, in mammals, including humans, uh, DOPA is not found in, in proteins. It's only found in the marine environment and used in organisms that really have to attach to wet uh, surfaces. So it has very special properties and it's a very versatile glue, which gives these proteins their ability to attach to surfaces. And, and, and so we have over the years learned a lot about DOPA and its contribution to adhesion in these proteins. And then the rest of my talk, I would like to tell you about how we use that information. And one of the things that we've learned over the years, if you look in the upper right corner of this slide, which is the, the uh, element of the DOPA amino acid, which is special as it relates to adhesion, is this thing right here, which is called a catechol. Okay, it's a uh, aromatic benzene ring with two hydroxyl groups. That's a very, very special and unusual chemical feature of an amino acid. And its presence in these proteins allows the, the muscle to secrete and attach to surfaces very effectively. So my group, what we do, and this is you know, embraced in the idea of bioinspiration, we, at the end of the day, we synthesize synthetic materials that are, that are inspired by these proteins. So we don't actually make or use the proteins, but we make synthetic polymers into which we chemically synthesize and install that catechol functional group that we have found in uh, muscle adhesive proteins to be really important. So we can make a variety of, of architectures and compositions of molecules. And then hopefully at the end of the day, we can use them in several ways. One is to actually study um, uh, muscle adhesion. So I won't talk about that this afternoon, um, but we can we can use these as as uh, model systems for understanding muscle adhesion, and then we can also think about translating uh, these polymers in the form of medical or consumer adhesives. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. In the area of basic research, um, we were approached by a group um, from Caltech to uh, they they are studying uh, a jellyfish locomotion. Um, of all things. And they wanted to attach electrodes onto the jellyfish. So these are the electrodes that you see here and they needed a water resistant glue. So they came to us and we sent them some of our synthetic muscle inspired glue, which is being used here to attach uh, these electrodes onto the um, cap of, of the jellyfish. And they're using that to study, you know, the ask basic fundamental mechanical questions about locomotion of uh, jellyfish. So that's an example of how our, our work can be applied to basic um, uh, studies. Uh, I wanna tell you about two medical applications just very briefly. Um, one is um, upper left here, which is uh, a, a potential treatment for diabetes, which is the idea of translate, uh, transplanting uh, islets, which are the, the uh, clusters of cells in the pancreas, which fail during um, uh, diabetes and which can be implanted into humans as a treatment for uh, diabetes. So that's one application. And then I'll talk about also fetal surgery. Uh, actually, I'll do fetal surgery first. Um, okay, so fetal surgery. What is fetal surgery? Um, fetal surgery is a growing surgical discipline, which it, it involves surgical interventions or surgeries done on the fetus in the womb 
usually in the second trimester. Uh, the, there's a couple examples of, of treatments that are uh, done for um, uh, various conditions. Spina bifida can be treated by operating on the fetus in the womb in the second trimester. Also something called TTTS, which is uh, twin twin transfusion uh, syndrome, which is a condition where you have twins in the womb and uh, there's an unequal supply of blood to the two twins. And, and this is one of the surgeries that is done um, also to rectify the uneven blood flow. And both of these uh, approaches to treatment involve uh, or require access into the womb. And for this, you have to, you have to basically break through the, the fetal membranes, the fetal membranes, which is, this is what we call the amniotic sac. Okay, and this is often requires some sort something on the order of three or five millimeters. So it's a pretty large defect in the in the uh, in the womb. This has been practiced um, since the early 1980s. Uh, this guy right here, Dr. Michael Harrison from UC San Francisco, he was the first surgeon to ever do one of these procedures on on a fetus. Um, and uh, in fact, this is a picture from. 2005 of Mike uh, examining that baby that was first uh, the first ever uh, fetus to be treated by him and successfully brought to full term, uh, and that patient was at that time uh, 20 something years years old. So it's a, an incredible story. Uh, and now these procedures are are practiced is very specialty procedure. Um, and the reason it's, it's uh, limited in, in its extent is because there's a lot of risks to this. And one of these risks is involving the penetration of the amniotic sac. And the reason for that is the amniotic sac has almost no healing capacity. So once you poke a hole in it, um, it does not heal. And this has significant risks uh, for the fetus, okay? You, get, you have the possibility of leakage of the amniotic fluid out, um, bacteria getting in, and also a traumatic rupture of the membranes, okay? And, and this, this uh, has, has been um, uh, referred to as the Achilles heel of this surger, surgery procedure because it's one of the things that really holds surgeons back. And to get an idea of what this, why this is the case, if you look at um, a plot of percent survival of a fetus versus gestation. So full gestation is 39 weeks out here. Could say that's um, uh, full nine months. The, sur the surgeries are done usually between week 16 and 26, so in this gray shaded area. And for a normal fetus, the percent survival, if they're uh, born prematurely during this period of time, is very low, okay? Um, and, and so if this procedure induces some harm and uh, um, results in premature birth, the survival rate is very low. Okay, and so there's a there's a great need actually for adhesives to seal these uh, during the surgery procedure itself, and that's one of the things that we have been doing now for about ten years. Uh, here is one of our synthetic polymers. Um, I'll just point out the um, uh, functional group that is found the catechol that is found in the muscle adhesive proteins. We now put this into a synthetic polymer and made a glue out of it. Uh, this is a collage of pictures taken of a human amniotic uh, sac um, that has been repaired with one of these adhesives, okay? Uh, so the purple material here is our glue, muscle-inspired glue. Here's the defect where, where the puncture was made, and it, that's uh, uh, several millimeters. And uh, the glue here attaches well to the wet tissue and bridges this defect and was uh, good enough to withstand 120 millimeters of mercury, which is more than sufficient for um, third trimester intrauterine uh, pressure. We also conducted a in vivo study in uh, rabbits uh, where we showed that the uh, survival rate of um, uh, rabbit fetuses uh, was 
increased from 36% if you do if you just do the puncture and do nothing. 36% uh, of the fetuses survive, and we could increase that to 80% with our adhesive plus a, a basically a, a little plug that we um, glued in with our, our adhesive. So from 36 to 80%, very promising. We are still working on this, and, and currently I can just tell you that one of our approaches is uh, to actually put in the adhesive before the surgeon actually breaks through the membrane. And this we call pre-sealing. So this is work that's ongoing. Uh, the surgeons are remarkable at, at, at uh, using their, their surgical tools. So a surgeon can actually get into this little space between the, the amniotic sac and the uterine wall and put our adhesive in there and, uh, and then allow it to solidify and provide mechanical support for the actual intervention. So we're hoping that this turns out to be a um, even better approach. And then I'll just wrap up by saying that we're also interested in, in um, some things related to consumer adhesion. And the one that we've done the most work on is uh, illustrated here, which is uh, the very common uh, type of adhesive, which is called pressure sensitive adhesives. So these are pretty much any, any kind of tape or membrane that is glued down on his, onto a surface. So posted as an example of, a, of an adhesive, scotch tape, uh, et cetera. These are all pressure sensitive adhesives. So basically the idea here is you have a, you have a backing, some sort of a backing uh, material. In the case of the posted, it's paper. And then you have an, a, an adhesive layer and uh, the pressure part of PSA is that it's just basically you press with your finger. Um, usually that's sufficient to adhere to the tissue, uh, to, to the, the surface that you're trying to adhere to. Uh, these are often, not always, but often are synthetic polymers. And um, we're interested in, in making these um, better performing underwater. Most, most of these actually are not great uh, underwater. Uh, and I can illustrate um, to you one of the polymers that we have recently made. Sorry, there's a lot of data on this slide, but basically here's the polymer. Uh, it's a pressure sensitive adhesive polymer with, again, the muscle inspiration is right here with the catechol in that polymer. And then we measured the strength of adhesion of a little particle of, of either uh, glass or polystyrene or polyethylene to this, P, uh, this um, polymer surface with and without the muscle inspiration. And you can see if you just add a few percent of that muscle inspiration under underwater, you can increase the adhesion to glass uh, several fold. Uh, it works a little better um, under it for, for polystyrene and we still have a lot of work to do for polyethylene. So it really doesn't have much of an effect on uh, polyethylene adhesion, uh, but it does significantly increase the adhesion, it, it, uh, wet adhesion strength uh, to um, oxide surfaces. And I'll just show a, a cute little video that we made of, of this. Um, there's, you may have seen this in the stores. There's something sold by 3M, which is called extreme post-its. They're advertised as water resistant sticky notes. Um, let me restart this, uh, go back to the start. Um, here in the video, this is a posted extreme note we bought from the store, put a little weight on there and it falls off underwater. Um, and we made our own sort of variation of this with our muscle inspired polymer. And you can see here a 500, uh, 500 gram weight underwater, um, our muscle inspired sticky note uh, performs much better. So I will wrap up. I think I've used um, most of my time. So uh, just to summarize, we're in general, we're uh, working on bioinspiration, taking ideas and concepts and models from nature and applying them to synthetic materials for a variety of applications. I told you about medical adhesion and uh, consumer adhesion. And, um, and, and uh, we're continuing to work on this and hopefully some of these things will end up um, either in your grocery store or uh, as, as uh, healthcare materials for, for the future. Um, final thing to, to uh, say is that I appreciate the hard work of my research group. Uh, this is our annual party at the beach where we uh, pull mussels off the rock and cook them up. Uh, and then I just wanted to say 
uh, because it's important these days that um, taxpayer money is really important. Almost everything that I talked about was funded by National Institutes of Health. Uh, so your taxpayer money is hard at work and making a difference uh, for us in academic research. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and thank you for your attention. Awesome, thank you so much. I have a, I personally have a thousand questions for you. Um, and I'm thinking about a presentation I saw with this lady who was attaching um, geo, like geo trackers to baby turtles. Um, yes. That was yes. where my first thought went. She went with acrylic because it could yeah, I know. Um, adjust as uh, the turtle grew, but apparently that was a massive problem that she was trying to figure out. So that was my first thought. Um, yeah, and I won't take any more time because Dr. Crosby, you can just you go for it. So thanks, Kim. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to come here and um, speak with all of you today. Um, that was a great talk following you know, from Phil. And I love the way he started by outlining and kind of going through this definition of bioinspiration and biomimicry. Um, I, I think Phil and I think about this in very much the same way where we kind of come at it um, from more of the bio-inspired um, aspect. So you'll hear that and, and see aspects of that through today's talk. Um, so today I'd like to tell you, oops, sorry about that. Um, today I'd like to tell you about some of the work that we have done and been working on related to a product that's come out um, called Gexkin. And this is a long evolving story um, and it involves many people. And so, just in case I, I forget to introduce them throughout the talk, I'd like to introduce some of the main players. Um, so Duncan Urshik is a professor here at UMass Amherst in bio biology. Um, he and I have collaborated for some time and you'll hear through this um, talk today about when we started to um, meet each other and how that collaboration came about. Um, Mike Bartlett, Andrew Kroll, um, Dan King, Mike Ambergia and Satyan Chowdhury are all PhD students that worked on this project over the years with me. Um, Mike, Andrew, and Dan are all professors at different um, universities around the world. Mike Ambergia and Satyan both work at companies. And Beth Parrott was an undergraduate um, art history major who worked in my lab for about three years um, at the beginning of this project and, and had some really nice essential roles in both the development of the technology and um, visualization of some of our findings. So with that, I'd like to jump in and, and talk about geckos. So I think we're all aware, um, I'm sure if you've traveled anywhere um, tropical or maybe not even so tropical, you may have seen a lizard, may have been a gecko, um, and some of the amazing things that they can do, they can adhere to a wide variety of surfaces like this really complex tree trunk that was imaged by Duncan and his collaborators, or they can even stick inside your house so on the wall or up on the ceiling or on the window. Um, and they can do really amazing things because so, it's not just about sticking there, but it's also about removing that adhesion or that adhesive device and running um, to get away from prey um, or predators. And this amazing ability to not only stick really strongly, but also release and run and move and, and locomote is some of the reasons why geckos have provided a lot of inspiration for thousands of years to scientists and engineers. Um, so a lot of the, the secrets to how this work, not surprisingly work or start to um, point to their adhesive pads, which are located on their toe pads that are shown here, whether they're attaching to glass um, or trying to peel away in this really cool way of how they bend back their toe pads as they, as they run and prepare to run. If we zoom in, so a, a lot of researchers back in the, um, well, actually for the last several decades, started to wonder what allows a gecko to have this amazing performance, right? Of stick and release, stick and release, and to do it on such a huge variety of surfaces. So the first thing that scientists started to do was really zoom in on these toe pad surfaces. And we can do that. So the, the first thing you notice are these rays, or arrays of um, what are called lamellae okay, that make up each of the toe pads on this, on this gecko here that we're looking at. If you zoom in with an electron microscope onto one of these lines or one of these lamellae, what you're going to see are these arrays of hairs, hair-like structures, and these are called setae, okay, and they're made out of keratin, uh, beta keratin, just like your hair or your fingernails, made out of the same exact material. Um, and 
they're down at the, the base of the, the sete, they have about the same diameter as one of our hairs, maybe just a little smaller. But as, they, as you branch up and come to the tip, they actually split again. Many of them will split again into what are called spatulae. And they're made out of the same material again, but they get even smaller. Okay, so now you can see that the width of one of these spatulae is around 200 nanometers or so. This is incredibly small. And the thickness is about five nanometers. So you're getting down to the dimensions of one protein thick. Now, obviously, as scientists started to discover this amazingly hierarchical structure, they started to say, this must be the secret to what is allowing a gecko um, to perform some of its amazing functions of adhesion. And so back in the early 2000s, a lot of scientists and a lot of engineers started to say, okay, if we can mimic these hair-like features, then we will be able to have similar performance. And so there's a, there was a huge effort um, involving many scientists and engineers. We were part of that effort. Um, like I said, maybe there were about 30 to 40 research groups around the world really looking at this. Um, I'm just featuring a couple examples here that were really cool. Um, this is out of Professor Li Ming Dai's where they took carbon nanotubes, covered it on a little, little piece of silicon wafer about the size of a fingernail, and they were able to hang up a, a textbook. Um, or this is Sticky Bot out of Mark Kukowski's lab in Stanford, and they were able to make small little pads on not quite carbon nanotubes, but similar small features, and have a robot that can climb up the wall. Now, this was cool, cool technology, but if they tried to make something larger, okay, so if I just made this a, a larger textbook or a little larger robot, um, it would all fall, okay? So there was a lot of problems of trying to figure out how do we actually scale this or actually use this technology on larger things, okay? And that's one of the ways that we got into the research that I'm gonna tell you about today. So, Part of the reason why engineers were so fascinated by this of making smaller and smaller features on the, on the surface or these hairs, not just did they see them on the bottom of a gecko foot, but they looked at plots that looked like this. So this is actually counting on the y-axis here, counting how many hairs or these setae per area are found on different organisms. The lizards here are the geckos, but you can see that these hair-like features are found on spiders and bugs and flies and beetles. And they can count the number of hairs and compare them to the size of the organism, so the mass or, or how much they weigh. And what you find is the heavier animals or the heavier organisms had more hairs per area. That means that I'm making smaller and smaller features. And so this map here became a guiding pathway that a lot of engineers said, okay, if I want to hold up maybe a person, then I need to be way out here and need to make really, really small fibers. Now, the, the problem with this, though, is that if you don't include enough data, you may come to the wrong conclusion. So there were some other scientists. Um, this is out of Robert Full's lab at Berkeley and Tony Russell's lab um, up at the University of Calgary. They made the exact same plot, but instead of just highlighting six or so data points here for the geckos, they looked at a much larger data set. This whole group up here are the geckos, and the body mass varies by 10,000 times. And what you see, if I look across all of these series of geckos, is that actually the number of hairs doesn't really change. So the size of these hair-like features or setae doesn't really change. So if we, when we started, as a group, started comparing these two plots, we started to say, what is the scaling parameter? What allows an animal or nature to use adhesion at all different size scales? because it's not the hairs. That's what this data is telling us. And another way of saying this is, how can we understand how to use adhesion for something as small as a leaf beetle to something as large as a gorilla, okay? Nature has taken care of using it for lizards and leaf beetles, but we wanted to make the leap of something as large as a gorilla or maybe a person being able to use adhesion um, for locomotion. So the way that we approach this having been inspired by all these different sources and different observations in nature, um, was to take a step back. We actually started by developing a theory, a, a scaling theory. So we actually started with the math. We wanted to almost ignore a lot of the specific features that were found on different organisms and start to think about how would, what controls this from a mathematical point of view. And this is where Andrew Kroll and Mike Bartlett, a postdoc and a PhD student at the time in my group, 
came about and we developed a theory and there were some critical assumptions in here. I'm not gonna go through them today, but at the end, it came out to be a very simple theory that the force capacity of this adhesive pad is gonna be dictated by three terms of van der Waals forces between the pad and whatever surface it's trying to come into contact with. We can discuss van der Waals during questions, but they basically exist between any two surfaces. So they're not very special, okay? And you can't do anything to scale them. The other parameters are the area, how large your toe pad is. That makes sense. If I wanna hang something heavy or have a lot of force capacity, then I need to have a larger pad. However, it is divided by compliance and compliance is how soft something is, okay? So if I wanna have a large force capacity, then I wanna make this softness or the compliance really small. And for most materials, this is a problem because if I wanna have a large area of contact, I usually make something really soft and squishy to make sure that it gets into all the nooks and crannies. Um, so if I make something soft, and try to get something large, then this ratio here doesn't, doesn't continue to increase. So how does nature do this? How does it make a large area, but also make something not soft? So this is what we needed to figure out. This is what the math looks like behind. I know we have some teachers and we have some students. There really is math behind here. Um, the theory isn't just all words. There's a lot of good um, calculus and differential equations that come out, but the final equation looks like this. This is what that equation looks like in symbol form. So this GC here is the strength of the Van der Waals forces. This A is the area and this C is the compliance. So this was a theory, it's a hypothesis at the time. We had to go through, we ran hundreds, I think maybe even up to a thousand different experiments on different synthetic materials just to prove that this works. The fact that this line, this black line goes through all these different data points told us that it worked. So we felt pretty confident in this. Um, but then we started to think, how can we take advantage of this? How do we actually make a, a material that can be really non-soft or stiff, so have a small value of C, but still have a large area of contact? And the, the idea came to us, or the inspiration came to us one Sunday um, afternoon that this is exactly what fabrics do, okay? So fabrics and textiles are designed, they're materials that have been around for about 80,000 to 100,000 years. And they're designed to conform to really complex surfaces and objects. But yet when I pull on a fabric along the fiber, it's really stiff. So you can have a large ratio of A and a small value of C. This gives us a really large force capacity. So we wanted to test this. So on Monday morning, literally on Monday morning, I asked um, Andrew and Mike at the time to run down to the local Joanne Fabrics. They bought some nylon fabric. They coated it with a very soft piece of elastomer or soft elastomer called um, polydimethyl siloxane, um, which is a common material found in like bathroom caulking and silly putty and things like this. And they made, a, made an adhesive device. I know you can't hear them talking, but they're explaining what this, this pad looked like or this pad was made up of. You can see it's about the size of your hand. So it's about a four inch by four inch square pad and they're gonna hold up a 45 pound weight or try to hold one up, okay? They're gonna hold this up onto a piece of um, plexiglass that they had set up between two file cabinets that were in a hallway um, outside our labs. So they hold it up and then they're gonna tilt it just a little bit and it's gonna be a really fast release. And you can't hear the bang, but you'll watch it fall. So it comes off really quickly. And we were super thrilled when we found this result because this was exactly how we developed that whole theory. And like I said, I didn't go into all the details, but we wanted to snap off. It would either be on or off. So it's about this really unstable failure. And that's exactly at the heart of the theory. And so everything they developed here said it's working. But the fabrics that you buy at Joanne Fabrics are not the stiffest fabrics that you can find in the world, okay? We knew this as material scientists. So we went on and to make new composites or new adhesive composites, but now rather than using a nylon fabric like the black one that was in that video, we substituted and started to make these adhesive pads out of carbon fiber fab based fabrics. 
This is a plain weave carbon fiber fabric. And if you cut this through the, um, or like cut this, this along this line, you can look at it from the end and you'll see the bundles of carbon fibers here. And it's bound, in this case, this is not polydimethylsiloxane, but this is polyurethane. And importantly, what I want to point out is that at the top, this is the top surface of these pads. They're completely smooth. They have no hair-like features, no sete. Because again, our theory told us that actually by making those hair-like features, you will be compromising the strength of the surface. And so we wanted to make these completely smooth. We replaced the function of the sete that the gecko uses by using a very soft elastomer, this polyurethane. And that replaced everything without having to make it very hair-like. This is the work of Mike Bartlett and the other PhD student, Dan King. And by making this composite, we were now able to move on from not just one plate of 45 pounds, but you'll see here that we have, a, we have five plates. They're taking one of these pads and they're gonna attach it to glass. Um, and you can see that we became a little bit more um, sophisticated with our setup here. We didn't have um, file cabinets or anything. And we now have some safety gear um, on their shoes in case these plates fall. Um, they're gonna lower these weights down. So right now this weight is holding up those, um, or this chain is holding up those weights. Mike is releasing that. And all of these five plates are now gonna be placed um, to be held by this one single pad, which is actually the same size um, as that previous one. It looks a little different in proportion, but it's the exact same area. And what you find, now there's no tension on the chain. All the tension is on that, on that um, pad. And at the time they wanted it, when you're holding up 250 pounds on a piece of glass, you can get a little nervous. So they wanted to practice to make sure that you're confident in this result. So they did this little jig. Um, and I'm gonna scoot ahead here a little bit. And you'll see that uh, Mike will just go ahead and put the weight back on the chain so we don't let it slam down into the floor like we did in our very first measurement. So that'll come off. They'll disconnect the weight and they'll just peel it right off. And you can use this over and over again um, to do that. In fact, we still have that same pad around in our labs today. So sticking to smooth surfaces is really cool, um, but obviously geckos can stick to a wide variety of surfaces. We wanted to handle this as well. Um, and we developed and extended our theory. I won't take the time to explain, or explain how it all happens, but essentially you can find this video up on our YouTube channel. Um, we used the exact same kind of approach. We made a slightly different pad now out of glass fiber based fabrics, and we can march different weights around all around our building without cleaning any of the surfaces or cleaning of the pads. So it's going from a painted door onto a painted drywall. In this same video, um, they go outside, they go on the concrete, they go on to different uh, plaster surfaces, glass surfaces, metal surfaces all around. So I'd like to come back to the gecko. Um, like I said, we started by looking at this theory after becoming inspired by all the different animals and how they were working, but we felt like this equation was teaching us something about how the gecko actually does what it does, because it's the largest of the organisms that can use adhesion for locomotion. So we were studying at the time some of the work of Duncan Urshik, who back in 1996 at the University of California, Berkeley, made some of the first measurements on full body geckos, okay? And he had actually measured that for a toke gecko, which is about 50 grams in mass, just a little smaller than the forearm of your, of your arm, um, they can hold up about 20 apples or 20 newtons of force. So he had measured the force capacity. Other people by the name of Keller Autumn had measured the strength of GC for geckos. Duncan had measured area, but nobody had measured the compliance of a gecko. So we couldn't test our theory right away. So this one, we reached out to Duncan. He had actually become a professor about a year prior to us reaching out to him at UMass Amherst. Um, so we were pretty lucky to have him here at, on, in Amherst. We reached out and we started to measure the compliance of a, a gecko. And this is one of the initial measurements here. We let the gecko establish their own contact with a glass plate. And as we pulled the plate away from the gecko, we're measuring the amount of force that the gecko is exerting on that plate. And that allows us to actually measure the compliance of the gecko 
as well as the force capacity, that FC. Um, and this is what the data looks like. Um, it looks incredibly linear, and there's some other fascinating science behind this, but it's incredibly linear. Here's FC, here's one over the compliance, and we can take this data and actually start to plot it. And we only not only tested one gecko, but we wanted to test a range of sizes. Remember, our whole idea here was to understand how nature moves across different size ranges and can use adhesion. And this is what this team of, of PhD students, this is Casey Gilman, who was a student in, in Duncan's group, that tested and plotted all the data. And amazingly, if you take all of the different data points and plot it, it actually continues to follow this scaling. And one of the cool things that we discovered um, was that by understanding the anatomy, which Tony Russell at the University of Calgary had documented many years ago, that geckos are one of the only organisms that have tendons in their lamellae that extend from the skin, basically, these lamellae, the tendon goes directly up into the skeleton. So in their body, in geckos, tendons connect bone to skin. That's completely different than in our body where tendons connect muscle to bone. So here, the tendon, which is one of the most stiff fibers and tissues found in, the, in, our, um, in nature, is providing that very stiff connection. So it's a very small value of C that allows us to have this large force capacity for the gecko. So the tendon and the tendon construction in geckos are really at the heart of the innovation. Um, and it's not the hairs or the setae, but it's this tendon connection behind that plays such a critical role. And so what I think is really cool about some of this story that we've been able to be a part of in our lab and, and discover is that nature provided the initial inspiration, led us to new theories, which then we tested and experimented with, we actually innovated by creating this new technology, but through this innovation and through this understanding, we actually were able to give back to nature and help connect some of the reasons for why geckos and all of the other organisms that use adhesion for locomotion, how they work and move beyond just understanding what's on the surface. Um, we've actually been able to take this understanding much, much farther. There's many other um, parts of the story that I can continue to tell you about. One part is that we were able to change the material systems to be fully compostable and still have the same um, purpose or the same function. So this is a, a kind of a cool new, new development, um, especially in today's um, day and age, of being able to make adhesives that not only can be used many times, but when it's done with its lifetime, they can go back and be reused again at a later point. And I'd like to finish with some final thoughts on bioinspiration. Um, so a couple of hundred million years ago, obviously, birds came onto this planet. And since then, humans um, have always been fascinated with flight, okay? And, you know, the taking flight is one of the most common, maybe, examples of bioinspiration. Birds can fly, humans cannot. How can we make that happen? How can we take advantage of, of flying? And, of course, you know the, the famous story of Daedalus and Italy, or Icarus. And what they focused on at the beginning, back many, many thousands of years ago for bioinspiration from birds, was the keratinous features of the feather. The feather, everybody thought, must be the key because humans do not have feathers, birds have feathers, therefore we must make something out of feathers in order to have flight. Obviously, if you know this myth, that didn't go so well. The, the feathers themselves don't really give rise to the flight. It wasn't until a couple hundreds or a thousand years later that da Vinci actually told us it's the shape and the stiffness of the wing structure, the stiffness and the shape or the underlying structure of the wing that is really the critical element of giving rise to flight. It's not the keratinous features on the surface. And as you know today, we take advantage of the stiffness and the shape to give rise to the flight and the, 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 uh, the planes that we use. And so in very much the same way um, for the Gexkin story, it's the story, the stiffness and the geometry and the shape of the tendon structures underneath that we use and we mimic to create the same functionality that the gecko uses um, in its everyday um, life. And with that, I'd like to also acknowledge um, all the funding sources. As, as Phil had mentioned, it's incredibly important today um, to realize that your tax monies um, are being used to uh, help us understand and help us innovate and impact the way we use materials and material science in the world around us. And I'd also like to finish um, just coming back to the students um, without them. 
um, none of this would be really happening. And we have a lot of fun um, working as a team on all of these research topics. So with that, I'll, I'll be happy to stop and we can move on to questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That's, that's very interesting. And I like the, um, you know, kind of your approach versus Dr. Messersmith's approach um, and hearing them both together. I think that's fascinating. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of questions, but um, we won't get to all of them. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone, everyone's time. Plus, you know, on the East Coast, it is getting to be seven o'clock, um, you know, so we're tired over here. Um, so again, one of the questions we have um, is, um, this is more for Dr. Master Smith, but um, why do most adhesives fail in water? And what, it, what is there about the, the dopa amino acid that allows it um, to, to be adhesive and adhere it within water? Yeah, so those are, those are great questions. So the, the effect of water is, um, well, not to, I, I, I can't drill down too, too deeply in the chemistry and physics, but basically um, the, the, the adhesion strength varies by the properties of the medium separating two surfaces. And uh, there's a huge difference in uh, the properties of the medium in air separating two surfaces versus water. And it, it, it turns out it's, uh, there's something called a dielectric constant uh, that um, Im impairs uh, adhesion when two surfaces are separated, even by a very, very thin layer of water. Okay. And if you're, if you're trying to adhere to a surface that is underwater or has already water on it, um, it's actually hard to, to truly get all of that water out when you, when you press, a, you know, like a tape or something on there. And, and so there's, there's often this very thin layer of water, which affects the, the interactions between the, the two surfaces. That's a, that's a very simplified, it, uh, you know, I say that at the risk of being oversimplified, but anyway, there, there is the effect of water, this chemical effect of water on the dielectric properties uh, between the two surfaces. Uh, about the second part of the question, what does DOPA do? Well, uh, we're still trying to figure that out, to be honest. Um, we could say the following, okay? DOPA has the ability, because of its chemical structure, to undertake um, the weak interactions, like um, Dr. Crosby mentioned, the Van der Waals interactions, but also it has the ability to actually engage in more robust chemical reactions, which might actually give rise to covalent bonds between surfaces. So in, in, in the possible range of amino acids, natural and otherwise, DOPA is unique in this respect in being able to um, take advantage of weak interactions as well as strong interactions. And so we believe, or I believe anyway, that they, you know, these are some of the reasons why uh, that that works so well in the in the muscle. And actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if, um, in terms of like you know gecko skin, skin, Dr. Crosby, if water um, sort of play, you know affects that adhesion. Oh course, um, you know. yes, I mean so <clears throat> um, for all the reasons that Phil or Dr. Messersmith Smith just you know explained. I mean, for most of the conventional materials that we would use, if you try to establish the interface underwater in the bath, like the um, video that um, Phil had shown, you know, get skin won't work. If you make the bond outside of the, the water and then bring it into water, it'll, it'll maintain. Um, it's really about expelling that. Um, but, you know, the, the nice thing about a, a lot of the systems that both Phil and I have talked about is they can actually be combined in different ways. So a lot of the principles are um, very compatible in that way. So the, the outer surface of our material could be made, for example, with the, the, some of the awesome polymers that, that Phil makes there, and then you combine the, both of the, or the, the best of both worlds. Awesome. And then, so, I mean, just because there's another question about this, I would imagine then um, things like oil would also impact adhesion. Yeah, I think either of us can take that and um, it'll definitely um, influence the adhesion, whether you're trying to get some of those weaker secondary forces or trying to get some of those stronger, more primary forces, 
establish that that oil in, in between will mitigate that um, bond for, forming. Awesome. Are there other, um, what other kind of animal or plant um, in terms of the world of adhesion and adhesives, um, besides the two that you've worked with, um, what other plants and animals um, do you know that researchers have drawn on? Mm. Uh, well, I can think of one, um, uh, which is uh, Velcro. Vel Velcro is a bio-inspired adhesive um, inspired by um, little uh, burrs uh, of plants that um, disperse by sticking to the uh, skins of animals as they walk through a, through a field. So those annoying little things that get get inside of my dog, uh, the fur, um, that's like a that that's basically what Velcro, as we know it, is modeled after. It's like little hooks um, that that come and grab whatever comes in contact with the the burr. So it's the Velcro is one of the famous examples of of biomimetic uh, materials, for sure. Awesome. Well, so then actually, this is an interesting question uh, for both of you is, you know, sort of in your work, um, and I'm sure you've talked to a lot of other scientists and researchers, are there any other sort of like materials that you've found uh, that you know of that have been other, like, you know, inspired by nature? So my first go-to is always owl feathers and helicopters, but, you know, that's an entirely different direction than material, like materials. Well, I, th I mean, Phil already mentioned Velcro. That's definitely one of the most famous ones uh, from a materials point of view. I mean, there's a there's a lot of work going on, a lot of materials coming out that are bio-inspired. Um, they're not all in the market right now, or not many of them, but there, there's a lot. I mean, we're working on one of the, we're working on a lot of systems that are actually inspired by some of the fastest moving organisms. So we have some new materials um, they're called elastomagnetic metamaterials. I need a better name, but they're, uh, it's not like gex skin, um, but they're materials that can give you an extra boost of energy um, when you're trying to do some really fast movements or, or move some robots and things like that. Um, but there, there's a huge array, I mean, of, of people that take inspiration from plants like the Venus flytrap or from um, plants like lotus leaves in terms of repelling water. Um, and making some different paints. There's also lots of different ways to control color, like butterfly wings do, like where you don't have to rely upon pigments, but it can use structure in a material. I'll do, I mean, put up my last slide because I do need to, uh, like you, you all do, I also need to thank my sponsors. So I need to thank everyone for joining us. For anyone who is still with us, I will send out a uh, link to the recording when it's all done and uh, processed. Um, and um, these sessions are sponsored by our major sponsors, which include the Benedum Foundation, the Virginia Department of Higher Education, Illumina, BAE Systems, Claude Moore Charitable Foundation, Akamai Technologies, Aerojet, Rocketdyne, Equitrans, Midstream, Jacobs Engineering, Lockheed Martin, and the TC Energy Foundation. Um, and to close us out, uh, could you each share a little bit about where do you see your research going next? Well, we're still working on this uh, fetal surgery. Uh, business, uh, you know, in the in the medical space, it takes a long, long time to uh, get things, um, you know, through preclinical studies and then uh, regulatory. So, you know, commercialization is a long road. So we're we're uh, still working on that. We also have an interest uh, currently on uh, mucoadhesion, which is, you know, mucosal surfaces are any of the um, uh, wet surfaces of the GI tract, uh, the reproductive tract, the surface of, of your eye, um, those are mucosal surfaces. And uh, we're interested actually in applying some of these principles to adhesion to mucosal surfaces. So, and these would be for the purposes of drug delivery. It, it turns out that these surfaces are notoriously difficult to, to adhere well to, and, and it's actually not very well understood in terms of the underlying science. So that's that's one of the things that uh, we are working on uh, currently. And um, for us, actually, um, we have some recent collaborations over the last couple of years, also along fetal kind of contacts, um, not during fetal surgery, surgery but also actually helping um, during the delivery process in some ways. But to something different, we're also um, have new collaborations with some companies uh, in the spa space exploration and space management um, um, arena. So um, there's new things to come out there.
Awesome. I personally very much look forward to it. Uh, so thank you both for presenting tonight. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful evening. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.